Dr. Cross, May is Preeclampsia Awareness Month. Tell us about the textbook definition of what of what preeclampsia means. So preeclampsia is when you develop um, high blood pressure in pregnancy, typically with blood pressures greater than 140 over 90, um, as well as having protein in your urine um, or having other lab abnormalities. And it seems like a lot of preeclampsia cases have been going undiagnosed or they're diagnosed too late. Mm -hmm. Why is this not a bigger conversation about this disease and this illness? It needs to be. It needs to be. Um, it's definitely more prevalent in um, the African-American and Hispanic community for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think that as time goes on, you're hearing about more people being diagnosed with preeclampsia as we start to become more aware of it. But I think we need to do a better job as providers of letting patients know um, the warning signs, the early warning signs of preeclampsia just so they can be looking out for these. Because if you've never heard of it, if you've never had preg uh, pregnancy before, if you've never known anybody with it, you may not know to look for those things. Yeah. So what are some of those symptoms, if you could think of any, that a mother could be looking out for after seeing this story and hearing the word preeclampsia? Some of the signs um, without checking the blood pressure would be swelling, which you can get in pregnancy as well, but sometimes um, lower extremity swelling, sometimes even swelling in the hands and the upper extremities, swelling in the face. Um, again, that can be normal in pregnancy, but sometimes to a different degree that can be an early sign of preeclampsia. Um, any spots in your vision, blurry vision, um, headaches that aren't going away with your over-the-counter medication, um, right upper quadrant pain, so right under your right breast um, where your liver sits. Um, those are some of the things that sometimes that um, can be a sign that you should get your blood pressure checked and if it's elevated, go immediately to the hospital. And how early can it be detected? I mean, are we talking the first trimester, third trimester, how early? Typically, we see a diagnosis in the third trimester. Um, there have been some, you know, more severe cases that have been diagnosed in the second trimester. Um, by definition, it's not diagnosed in the first trimester. Um, this is all after 20 weeks. Okay. And I'm going to run this quick stat by you. The United States is currently ranking 47th worldwide for maternal mortality overall with all of the different diseases. This is the only industrialized nation with a rising maternal mortality rate. What is the United States doing to kind of not pay attention to these maternal mortality rates? It seems like it's going untalked about. Right, it definitely is. And I mean, the number one cause um, of that disparity is systemic racism. And so um, our black and brown patients, our women are not being heard when they're coming with different complaints. They're kind of being brushed off or swept under the rug. Um, they're being discharged too early from the hospital um, and things like that. And so just not listening to our patients and um, the bias that is around the whole conversation. So unfortunately, as you know, you were not my doctor at the time. You're currently my doctor. I was diagnosed with preeclampsia. And unfortunately, I had to endure a stillbirth after that with my son. Talk about why, like you said, this is happening in black mothers and how likely is that outcome for it to be a deadly situation? Because I was told that the only cure for preeclampsia is delivery or the next step is unfortunately death. So how often are these outcomes where it's fatal for mom and baby? We definitely see um, it's not it shouldn't be a common thing, but we definitely see it more, like you said, in our black women. Um, it is something that if it's caught early enough, um, when it's at the preeclampsia stage before it becomes eclampsia, before you have the negative sequelae um, like a stillborn or things of that nature, um, it could be a much different outcome. So it's really early detection and then immediate intervention um, yeah. would definitely prevent the negative sequelae from potentially happening. What would you encourage the mother to do as far as being an advocate for herself? Oftentimes we feel like we can't address the doctor because they're the professional in the room. Even though our body might be telling us like, this is time for panic mode if the doctor tells you like, no, you're fine and they send you home, you trust that. How often should women be advocating for themselves and how can they speak up to their doctor and say, there's something truly wrong here? Women should advocate for themselves every single day. Anybody that loves and supports that patient needs to advocate for them as well. So I definitely know that it can be uncomfortable to speak up, especially like you said, in a position of power where the doctor has already spoken and they've already made a diagnosis and a plan and that's it. 
But I think it's really important to know that you have a voice and you're able to use it even when it comes to medical things. And so you can speak up for yourself and say, no, I'm not, I'm not leaving. I'm not, I'm not going to be discharged right now. I need somebody else. I need a second opinion. Do you have a partner? Do you have somebody that's higher than you? Um, same thing with nurses. You know, if you feel like your nurse isn't addressing the issue or isn't telling the doctor, I need the doctor to come in here. I need to speak with the doctor, you know, and so really being able to speak up when something is not right or you feel like something's not right. So there is a chance of survival for, for preeclampsia. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I was told that the only chances are delivery and death, but what happens when a mother walks in and hear, hears the word preeclampsia? What are the next steps that doctors should be taking? Because there's a small window of opportunity mm -hmm. to successfully have that child. So what should I be looking for moving forward? What should I be telling the doctor? Hey, look, I do have preeclampsia. I need to deliver this baby in the next 24 hours. It's definitely um, survivable. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, again, Again, if it's if it's caught early enough, mm -hmm. then we can do um, the interventions that's necessary. Mm -hmm. So it's not always going to be immediate delivery. It mm -hmm. depends on the gestational age of the baby. Um, so sometimes if we can stabilize the situation and we can now you're definitely going to be in the hospital. You're going to be inpatient. Mm -hmm. But if sometimes if we can stabilize the blood pressure, get your situation under control, and can continue to allow the baby to grow and develop a little bit more um, time in utero, we definitely try to do that. Um, if it gets to the point where it's severe preeclampsia, the recommendation 34 weeks or greater is immediate delivery. We're not waiting, we're not doing anything to delay things um, at that point. Mm -hmm. So definitely something that I think is important for patients to know is that when you get a diagnosis of preeclampsia, more than likely you're going to be admitted to the hospital so they can monitor your blood pressure, cycle your blood pressure, and then so you, you're going to have an IV in. So if you don't like needles, I'm sorry. You're going to have an IV in, and we're going to continue to check labs. We're going to continue to administer fluids and sometimes magnesium um, sulfate if you have severe preeclampsia to prevent seizures, which is when you move from preeclampsia to eclampsia. So these are all things that we need to have um, in a controlled setting. And so that's why we don't make the diagnosis and let people kind of walk around and continue to go to work and things like that when they have a diagnosis. Is there a correlation between developing preeclampsia and the HELP syndrome? Because I know for my specific situation, it started as a preeclampsia. I'm not sure if it transformed to the eclampsia or we went right to the HELP syndrome and to the DICE mm -hmm. situation. How does that progression happen? Because people think that the last step is preeclampsia preeclampsia and this is, you know, there's no other steps to look out for. What is HELP syndrome and how does it progress from preeclampsia to HELP? Yeah, so preeclampsia um, is when you have the blood pressures and the protein in your urine or you just have severe range blood pressures, maybe some ab lab abnormalities. With the HELP syndrome, it's when you're having um, elevated liver enzymes, when you're having low platelets, and so platelets is what helps your blood clot. So if your platelets are low, then you can bleed out, you can hemorrhage. And so then that can lead to an issue with that. And so yes, that can definitely go from preeclampsia to HELP syndrome without ever having eclampsia. Mm -hmm. Eclampsia is defined by everything with preeclampsia, but then now having seizures. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes it pre versus actual eclampsia. So you can skip the eclampsia completely. Yeah and go to having HELP syndrome. And that is when you get concerned, um, when you talk about things like DIC um, or things like that, that's a result of that coagulation po um, pathway being altered. So that's when it's very risky from a hemorrhage standpoint. Or how much attention should the average pregnant mother be giving to this? Should we be doing research? Are there pamphlets that we should be reading? Or is it just kind of like, we'll worry about that bridge if we have to cross it? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of resources out there. I know the Preeclampsia Foundation definitely has a lot of different resources to educate yourselves on it. But I, honestly, I think these are conversations you should be having with your healthcare provider. Um, I talk to all my patients about potential preeclampsia, knowing what to look for, making sure that everybody has a blood pressure cuff to be able to check their blood pressure. Because um, as you know, you can be completely normal, feel fine one day, and the next day have preeclampsia and have severe, you know, stroke range blood pressures. Yeah. So because that transition can happen literally within minutes, it's important to have something already, not like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go buy one tomorrow, I'm gonna go ahead and order it on, t on Amazon, and yeah. no, you need to have one at the house. Yeah. So that's what I would say. So I think everybody needs to be paying attention to it, and it's not just for black and brown patients. I mean, of course, we see a higher prevalence with that population, mm -hmm. but I mean, other 
populations can also have preeclampsia too. So I think every pregnant woman should be watching their blood pressure. Yeah, we were both diagnosed with preeclampsia. You being a doctor, you kind of went into other healthcare professionals. You kind of didn't want to blow your cover and tell them mm -hmm. that you were a doctor because you wanted to see how patients were genuinely being treated in the community. Mm -hmm. What was your experience with that? And you finally had to step up and say to the doctors, like, I know what I'm talking about. This is what this means. And you had to even be in the position that some of us are in as an advocate for yourself. So kind of share what tipped you off to this might be this, this might be this, and what made you kind of be an undercover boss and go in from that <laughs> range while you were delivering your beautiful baby girl? Well, um, so my, my doctor um, knew that I was an OBGYN, okay. um, and he was amazing. Yeah. Dr. Lee, um, Dr. Carl Lee, he was my doctor. He was amazing. He knew I was a doctor. Okay. Um, we already had conversations about preeclampsia um, as we saw little things, you know, starting to develop. The first time he tested me for preeclampsia, I actually um, didn't meet the criteria. Mm -hmm. But I was concerned because I had rapid weight gain at the end of the pregnancy, started seeing swelling, my glove size and the OR wasn't fitting. I started to see the subtle signs that I knew to bring to him. Mm -hmm. Now in the hospital, yeah, the nurses, um, they didn't know that I was an OBGYN um, who had dealt with preeclampsia all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so it was important for me um, being a physician and being somebody who has diagnosed many women with preeclampsia, it was important for me to really pay attention to my body and start to notice the things like the subtle changes in my face and my hands. Um, start to notice like my blood pressure would be higher than what it was. Even though it didn't meet the criteria, it was like 130s over 80s when normally I'm like, 110 over 70s so you know you start to notice those things and so I think it's important to just really be in tune with your body um, and I think I did have that advantage being a physician and being somebody who was specifically an OBGYN yeah. that I knew the things to look for and everybody doesn't have that same um, background and that advantage to be able to know when to go to the hospital and um, I'll never forget like I literally worked a whole day I went home, my mom was in town because um, I was concerned because I had preeclampsia, but it was mild at first. And so I was still working. I wasn't the best patient. Um, and so I did ask my mom to come in town because I knew that something was probably going to happen soon. And then when I came home from work, I was sitting on my um, the floor in my daughter's nursery and I just felt nauseous. I didn't feel right. And I was like, go get my blood pressure cuff. And when I checked my blood pressure, it was like 160s over like 110. And so I was like, okay, let's pack a bag. And my mom was like, well, let's just go to the hospital. I was like, well, let's pack a bag. We're not coming home. And she's like, you're not going home. I was like, they're going to deliver me. She's like, you're only 35 weeks. I was like, after 34 weeks, I knew I was going to get delivered. So, um, you know, that was something that I knew going into the hospital. By the time I got to the hospital, it was like 180s, 190s, over 110s. So it just kept going up until I was able to get treated. Mm -hmm. So I just say that it's important for women to listen to your body. And if something doesn't feel right, go to the hospital. I think that um, we're seeing it a lot. I think that that is where sometimes it comes to be a difference in having a provider that can... Um, that looks like you, a provider who can relate to some of the things that plagues our community. Um, so preeclampsia, like there are a lot of doctors in the community, they see preeclampsia, they're like, oh, she's high risk and they move you to a high risk doctor versus a lot of us, people of color who have feel comfortable um, managing preeclampsia because we see it every day. Yeah. You know, I still continue to manage those patients, of course, with the help of a high risk doctor weighing in. So I think I do think it makes a difference in having a doctor who is familiar with it and knows to look for those things. At every single OB visit, I'm checking their blood pressure. At every single OB visit, I'm checking their urine. And patients get annoyed and I'm like, I don't care. I need you to pee in a cup. Because I'm looking for those subtle things that you may not really notice. Right. Um, and then making sure everybody has a blood pressure cuff. So I think at the end of the day, um, I think you should feel comfortable with your provider. I think this is something you should bring up to your provider. Don't just do your research online. It's good to do that as well, but it's also important to have that conversation on what things can you do preventatively. Like taking a baby aspirin has now been shown to be helpful at preventing um, the, the development of preeclampsia and things like that that you start off in the first trimester.